Hello friends, welcome to the fourth episode of the How to Play Dungeons and Dragons series. In previous videos, we have learned how to overcome challenges and do combat. This time, we will learn how to adventure and survive in the day-to-day -day world of Dungeons and Dragons. Despite the name, the game isn't confined in a dungeon. The game world is whatever the dungeon master imagined it to be. You could be adventuring in a dense forest, verdant hills, or the mountains, but to get from place to place, you will need to know how to travel, and DND has its specific rules for traveling. Now, the party wants to travel to a nearby town to stock up on gear. Let's see how you can go about doing that. There are three traveling paces you can choose from. Fast, normal, and slow. At normal pace, you cover 24 miles in a standard 8 hours traveling day. Going slower, at 18 miles a day, allows you to use stealth and you can try to surprise or sneak by creatures you encounter. Going faster, at 30 miles a day applies negative 5 penalty to your passive perception, making it harder for you to notice hidden threats such as monsters or traps. The travel speed you see assumes that you are traveling in a relatively simple terrain, such as open plains or road. When traveling in difficult terrains like a dense forest, you travel at half speed. Going faster is not the only way your perception can be impeded. When your vision is slightly obscured like being in patchy fog, moderate foliage, or dimly lit hours of twilight or dawn, you have disadvantage on perception checks that rely on sight. When your vision is heavily obscured, such as being in opaque fog, dense foliage, or even complete darkness, you are effectively blinded. You attack with disadvantage and enemies who are not affected will have advantage attacking you. And naturally, you will fail all ability check that requires sight. Some races, like elves, dwarves, and gnomes have dark vision, which lets them see in darkness as if in dim light, but they see only in shades of grey. Random encounters work differently for each campaign module. Some modules make you, the player, roll a d20 and you will encounter some creature when you get above certain number. Others make the dungeon master roll a combination of dice at certain time interval. The way it works is not fixed. Some DMs who doesn't like random encounters don't even use it. So ask your DM if you want to know how he or she handles random encounter. Random encounters doesn't necessarily mean meeting monsters or enemies. Sometimes it could be just a traveling minstrel, but it could also be a trap magical phenomenons, or other hazards. If you fall, you take a d6 of damage for every 10 feet fallen to a maximum of 20 d6. Without air, you can hold your breath for 1 plus your constitution modifier minutes. After that, you can survive for a number of rounds equal to your constitution modifier before dropping to 0 hit points and begin dying. But Besides those life-threatening situations, there are more mundane concerns that require your attention. Food and water. This is not true to life, but following the game's rules, you need a pound of food a day or one ration to be properly fed. You can go without food for one plus your constitution modifier days, before suffering a level of exhaustion at the end of each day. A normal day of eating resets your count to zero. You need a gallon of water a day or twice the amount in hot weather. If you drink only half as much, you need to succeed DC 15 constitution saving throw or suffer one level of exhaustion. With less water, you automatically suffer a level of exhaustion. If you already have at least one level of exhaustion, your exhaustion will increase at two level increments. The word exhaustion doesn't sound that bad, but it greatly affects your character in-game. At level 1 exhaustion, you have disadvantage on all ability checks, and things get a lot worse as you accumulate more exhaustion level. At the 6 exhaustion level, your character dies. Getting rid of exhaustion is no simple matter either. You need to finish a long rest with some food and water to reduce your exhaustion level by 1. Even a high level magic, such as Greater Restoration, only restores exhaustion level by 1. Luckily, you can forage for food and water when traveling at slow or normal pace. Through the course of the day, you can take short rests. Short rests last for at least one hour. 
during which you cannot do things more strenuous than eating, drinking, reading, and tending wounds. You can recover hit points by using some of your reserve energy using your hit dice. To do that, you roll your hit dice and add your constitution modifier to every hit dice roll to regain hit points. You can use as many hit dice from your hit dice pool as you want per short rest. At higher level, you will have more hit dice, but recovering hit dice isn't easy. You only recover half of all your hit dice after finishing a long rest. A long rest lasts for 8 hours, during which you cannot do activities more strenuous than sleeping, eating, and standing watch for more than 2 hours. That's why you should take watch shifts. Long rest doesn't necessarily mean sleeping. Even elves who meditate instead of sleeping need to rest for a total of 8 hours. They can fill the rest of the time with like activities. Upon reaching town, the party decides to go through their shopping list. They don't have much individually, but they have created a party fund. They earn 200 gold pieces upon the completion of their last quest. Gold piece is the most common denomination, but there are other denominations which are also in use. 200 gold is worth 20 platinum, 400 electrum, 2000 silver, or 20,000 copper pieces. Electrum piece is a bit weird. It's actually based on a real naturally occurring gold-silver alloy. I don't know what it's worth in the real world, but in D&D's game, it is worth half a gold. In large enough settlement, you can buy all sorts of goods and services. Armors, weapons, adventuring gears, tools, mounts, vehicles, trade goods, food, drink, lodging, and other services. Before going on a shopping spree, let's decide what sort of lifestyle they will be having for the duration of their stay. Wretched, you don't have to pay anything, but it's unlikely that you want your character to live this kind of lifestyle. There are also other lifestyles such as squalid, poor, modest, comfortable, wealthy, and aristocratic. Your lifestyle expenses covers your meals, drinks, lodging, and other daily expenses. It doesn't offer any mechanical benefit, but story-wise, living the high life might give you opportunity to make more contacts with the rich and powerful. The party have decided to live comfortably at the cost of 2 gold per person per day. They deserved it after their last quest. However, Grant decided to live a modest lifestyle by staying for no cost at the temple of his faith. This is a feature of his acolyte character background. With that sorted, let's do some shopping. Before buying any piece of weapon or armor, you need to be sure that you are proficient in them. Your character's proficiencies can come from her class, race, or background. Without the right kind of proficiency, you will suffer the related penalties. If you are wearing armor you are not proficient in, you will have disadvantage on any ability check, saving throws, and attack rolls using your strength or dexterity. If you are not proficient in the weapon you are using, you simply do not add your proficiency to the attack roll. For example, Serio's attack roll with his longsword is plus 5. That's because he is proficient in martial weapons and longsword is one of them. We get that number by first taking his strength modifier and adding his proficiency to it. 3 plus 2, 5. But remember, we don't add the proficiency to the damage modifier, which only use his strength modifier. Without proficiency, his attack roll would only be plus 3. There are 3 main types of armor. Light, medium, and heavy. An unarmored person starts with 10 points of armor class. However, his armor class is affected by his dexterity modifier. Any bonuses or penalties from his dexterity modifier would be applied to it. So if he has plus 3 dexterity modifier, then his armor class would be 13. Light armor gives you higher base armor class. Leather armor, for example, starts you off at 11. Then you apply your dexterity modifier to it. Medium armor works pretty much the same way, but usually gives you a higher base value and caps your dexterity modifier bonus to 2 points. Heavy armor, on the other hand, just gives you a flat armor class value that doesn't get affected by your dexterity modifier. However, not many classes are proficient in it, and you need certain amount of strength to just be able to wear it. Some armors, due to being cumbersome, can give you disadvantage on your stealth check. There are two major types of weapons, simple and martial. They are further divided into melee or ranged. Simple weapons are weapons that doesn't require much training to use. Most classes are proficient in them, but not all. Martial weapons are weapons of war. Usually only classes that are focused on combat are trained to be proficient with them. 
but of course there are exceptions. Weapons have property tags on them. For example, Dagger has the Finesse, Light, Throne, and Range properties. Finesse means that you can choose to use your Strength or Dexterity to attack with the weapon. Once you have made the choice, you use the same modifier for the attack roll and damage modifier. Of course, you can still add your proficiency to the weapon if you are proficient in it. Light means that it is easy to handle and is suitable for fighting with two weapons. Throne means you can throw the dagger and make a ranged attack with it. Throne weapons use the same ability modifier as the weapon, as if you are making a melee attack with it. But since a dagger has the finesse property, they work in conjunction to let you use dexterity for your attack roll. The two numbers represent the effective range and maximum range for the weapon. The shorter range lets you attack normally with it, and the longer range means that it is still within the weapon's reach, but you make your attack roll with disadvantage. There are a lot of other weapon property tags and weapons with unique property combinations you can find in the book. Adventuring gears are always useful. Grappling hook and rope are practically a necessity in most adventures, and you can also buy many other things that can help you through your adventure. But there are also many other fun items you can buy. Ball bearings in a narrow hallway is practically an instant disco kit. Tools like thieves tools, herbalism kit, and musical instruments are usually the necessary equipments you need to perform your other proficiencies. Mounts and vehicles can be bought to make traveling easier and lighten your load. Trade goods like flour and salt, food, drink, lodging, and other mundane services are also available to buy, and there's price list of that in the book. Finally, you can also sell your usable equipment at half cost. But in general, weapons and armors worn by monsters and NPCs are not sellable. So don't spend too much time looting everything, because you won't be able to sell it anyway. And I think that's enough information to start you off on your journey. There is a wealth of information in this book on adventuring and equipments that hasn't been covered yet, but I will leave the rest for you to discover yourself. Happy adventuring! CJ, over and out.